Algebra 2, Semester 1, Final Review. Okay, on problems 1, 2, and 3, it's asking you to describe the transformation. A reminder about how transformations work. I'm just going to use a quadratic formula, or a quadratic equation here. It works the same with the absolute value problem in number 2. So the A right here is your stretch and compress. If A is less than 1, then it's a compress. If it's between 0 and 1, it's a compress. If A is bigger than 1, then it's a stretch. Your H is left-right. Left is a plus sign, and right is a minus, a subtraction. So remember that those go backwards. And then K is your up and your down. So looking at problem 1, this says that we went right 2 and up 3. Problem 2 says we went left 2, down 6, and compressed by 2 thirds. And problem 3 says up 4 and reflect. So this would mean that it would flip over. Your parent functions, recall, start at the origin. So I'm just going to graph your parent function for you on problem 1. That's your quadratic parent function. Your absolute value parent function is the same, except it's straight lines. So on these three problems, use those transformations to graph the equations. On number two, make sure that you use a table since you have a stretch or compress going on. For problem four, it's the same idea. We have an absolute value function. The A is a stretch compress. The H is left right. The K is up down. So you just need to write an equation that applies these transformations. For problem five, we need to graph this line. The first thing you need to do before graphing is get it in y equals mx plus b form. You're going to do that by moving the x over first by either adding or subtracting and then getting rid of this 2 by either multiplying or dividing. Once it's in y equals mx plus b form, you would start with b, so put your y-intercept along here. And then your slope, make sure that you make it into a fraction. If it's not already a fraction, you can put it over 1 and do rise over run. Problem 6 says to use the graph to write an equation. So we're using these two points. The first thing that you need to find is your slope. You're going to use slope formula here. Once you have your slope, you're going to pick your favorite point, And you're going to plug in a number for y, m, and x. Get your x and y from the favorite point that you picked. Get your m from the slope that you just found. Solve for b. In the end, you're going to have your answer be whatever you got for M right here, whatever you got for B right there. Problem 7, what is the table, what is the equation that represents the table? So 7 is exactly like 6, you just need to pick two points out of the table. So we'll use this point and this point. You could use other points if you want to. But just like problem 6, find your slope, then find your B and then plug them into your final equation. Problem 8. You could solve this problem by either substitution or elimination. If you wanted to solve this problem by substitution, I would suggest that you solve for this y right here by moving this 2x over by either adding or subtracting and then plugging in what you got for y right up here. If you were going to do this by elimination, which is the way I would do it personally, I would multiply this bottom equation by a negative 4 so that I get a negative 4y right here. When I add down, those would cancel out. 4y and negative 4y would cancel. Remember that your answer should be a point, x comma y. So once you find your x, make sure that you solve for y. Problem 9. This was the three variable systems that we did on pretty much a whole sheet of paper. So instead of remembering how to work these out all the way, since our final is multiple choice, I'm going to teach you how to use the answers. In order to use the answers to solve this problem, we're just going to plug each of our answers in. So I'm going to start with problem A right here, or answer A. I'm going to plug 0 in for x, 1 in for y, and 3 in for z in all three of my equations. If I get true statements, then that's my answer. So let's plug it in the first equation. Put 0 in for x, 1 in for y, and 3 in for z. So we get 0 minus 6 plus 12, 
and z negative 6 plus 12 would be positive 6, so that does not equal 12. So I know that A is not my answer. Now go on and try B, C, and D. Whichever answer it is has to work in all three equations, so you have to try it, plug it into all three equations. Problem 9.5 is asking what a parabola, what does a parabola with one solution look like, two solutions or no solutions? Remember that a solution to a parabola is on the x-axis. So one solution, your parabola would touch the x-axis once. Two solutions, your parabola would touch the x-axis twice. No solutions, your parabola would never touch the x-axis. For problem 10, we once again need to use transformations. So we have A is a stretch or compress, um, H is left or right, minus would be right and plus would be left, and then K is up or down. A plus is up and a minus is down. So 10 says that we want to have a vertical stretch by a factor of 4, so that would go where A is. Reflection would go out in front of A. Translation 2 units up, that would go for K. Problem 11 is asking us to describe the function from the parent function to the transfer, transformed function. This one is the parent function because it starts at the origin. So you're going to say that it moved right, it moved up, it also went down. So you're going to use specific words for those. Make sure that you tell me how many um, spots it moved each way. Problem 12, for graphing, our vertex is the point h, comma k. Remember, this is your h right here and your k at the end. That 3 would be a stretch. So once you put a point for your vertex on both sides, go over 1, up 3, over 1, up 3 to get that stretch of 3 in there. Problem 13 is just like problem 12. Problem 14 is in intercept form now, so our vertex we get by using P and Q. So if you recall, it's X minus P and X minus Q. So our vertex would be P plus Q divided by 2. That's the X part of our vertex. The Y part would be plugging that in, so plug it in, back into this original equation. So whatever you get for X, plug it back in, that'll be what you get for Y. To get your other points, just make a table, put your vertex in the middle, do a point above and a point below, plug them in to get these y values. Problem 15 is asking us to find the equation of the parabola. The way we do this is we look for the points we're given, and on this parabola we're given our intercepts, so p and q, and then an extra point. So we'll say that P is negative 2, Q is 6, and then our extra point is the point 0, comma 3. So we're going to use the P, the Q, and then our extra point and this equation. You're going to plug in a value for Y, X, P, X, and Q and you're going to solve for A. Once you get your value for A, you're going to put it right here, and your final answer will look like this. Don't forget, we always change the signs of P and Q whenever we plug them in to the equation. I just realized that that last equation got cut off, so I wrote it up above and circled it in red. Okay, problem 16 gives us a point and a vertex. So we're going to label our point as x and y, and our vertex is h and k. We're writing an equation of a parabola here. I'm going to use vertex form of my equation because I was given my vertex. You're going to take, you're going to plug in 12 for y, 2 for x, 10 for h, make sure it says minus 10, and then negative 4 for k, and you're going to solve for a. After you solve for A, your final answer will be Y equals whatever you get for A, X, or sorry, X minus 10, 
and then a minus 4 right there. So the main part you have to do here is solve for a. 17 is the exact same. Make sure that you're labeling your vertex as hk and then the other point as x and y. For 18, we're given a point, so x, y, and then our p and our q, our intercepts. So we're using this equation. You're going to plug in 3 for y, two, or sorry, 4 for x, 4 for this x. For p, you're going to put in negative 1, and for q, you're going to put in 5. Make sure that in your parentheses, a negative, negative 1 would be a positive 1. So for example, this parenthesis would be... 4 plus 1. So make sure you change the sign of your P and your Q. After you solve for A, your final answer is going to look like whatever you get for A goes right there, and then X plus 1, and X minus 5 for your final answer. 19 is the same thing. X and Y, P and Q. Problem 20 says to solve by factoring. Since it says solve, I know that my final answer is going to be x equals a number and x equals another number. So for factoring, this is easy factoring because I have a is 1, or I could say that it just starts with an x squared. So I need to figure out what multiplies to negative 16 and adds to 15. Once I have those numbers, I'm going to have whatever those numbers are in here. So x plus something or x minus something. And then in the end, I have to set each of these equal to 0, solve for x, and I'm going to get two answers. Number 21 is similar. You need to start by moving the 30 over. This one, however, is not level 1 factoring because I have a number out front here. Check for a GCF. If you don't have a GCF, then you're going to have to factor by grouping. When you do factor by grouping, you're finding what multiplies to a times c, a, b, and c, and what adds to b. So figure out what those factors are. You're going to rewrite your bx term. So you'll have 2x squared. You'll put those two numbers that you just found that multiply to ac and add to b right in the middle. You'll group the first two, group the last two, and then you'll pull out a GCF. Again, make sure that your final answer is x equals a number and another number. One of those is going to be a fraction for that problem. Problem number two, we're going to write this as a complex number in standard form. So first of all, I'm subtracting, so make sure that you distribute your negative and then combine like terms. For problem 23, it looks like we are multiplying, so you could either FOIL or you could set up the box method to do this. Remember, i times i is i squared, and that equals negative 1. So in your final answer, you should not have any i squareds. You should replace all of them with negative 1s and combine like terms if possible. Problem 24 is asking us to solve the quadratic equation using square roots. So we're going to get x squared, or whatever is squared alone, and then take the square root of both sides. For 24, we have our x squared alone already, so we can just take the square root of both sides. Don't forget that whenever you take a square root, you always put a plus minus in front of your answer. And square roots of negatives have i. So for example, if I took the square root of negative 4, that would be plus minus 2i. For 25, make sure that you move the 16 over first before you square root. And for 26, you first have to get rid of everything outside of the square root. You start by adding or subtracting the 100 over, then dividing by 4, then you can square root both sides. Just a quick example down here. It's not the same as the problem that's on 26. I'm just giving you a quick example. If you square root both sides, oh, let me change that from a 5. Let's make it a 9. If you square root both sides here, you're going to have x minus 2 equals a positive and a negative 3. Remember that you have to split this up. You have x minus 2 equals positive 3, 
and x minus 2 equals a negative 3, and you have to solve both of those. Problems 27 and 28, you need to use the quadratic formula on. Negative b plus minus square root b squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. So for 27, a is 3, b is 1, and c is negative 4. Make sure that whenever you're using your calculator here that you enter all of this in with the parentheses without the square root, and then simplify it by taking the square root. Problem 28 is the same. Problem 29 is asking you to solve the system by using the graph. So the way that we solve systems is graphically is by seeing where they intersect. That would be here and here. So you need to write down those two points of intersection. Make a note that your x-axis and your y-axis are both going by twos here. Problem 30 says to solve the system using any method, graphing, substitution, or elimination. I would not use graphing, and I would not use elimination. My suggestion here would be substitution. So take this equation right here, take the linear equation, and solve for y. The way that you solve for y, getting rid of this negative right here, is by dividing everything by a negative 1. Then you take what y equals and you plug it in for y in the equation up here. When you plug it in, you're going to have to get everything onto one side, get everything on the side that makes x squared positive, and then you're going to have to factor. So you're going to get two answers for x. Once you get two answers for x, your final answer is going to be two points. So take what you got for x, they go here, and plug them into the, back into one of the equations to get y. I suggest you plug them back into this equation right here once you have your two x's. Problem 31 is asking you to determine which of the following are polynomials. The two things you need to remember whenever determining if something is a polynomial is number one, the exponents have to be whole numbers, and number two, the coefficients have to be real. That means that you can't have a 2i or a square root of negative 5. Problem 36 is asking you to factor completely. First, check for a GCF. Then, group the first two, group the last two, pull out a common factor of the first pair, pull out a common factor of the second pair, and then rewrite them. Make sure that you look for difference of squares in problem 32. So, for example, if you ended up with 4x squared minus 1, that would be, that would factor into 2x minus 1 and 2x plus 1. Problem 33 is the same. Group the first two, group the last two, pull out a GCF from the first parenthesis, pull out a GCF from the second parenthesis, and rewrite it. Again, watch for a difference of squares. Problem 34, start with a greatest common factor. So I notice that 6, 21, and 45 can all be divided by 3. I also notice that there's an x in each of the terms. So you can pull a 3x out front. After you pull out a 3x, write what's left. You're going to have something with an x squared, something with an x, and something without an x. You need to figure out what multiplies. Actually, you're going to have a 2x squared right here. So you're going to have to do the factoring where you figure out what multiplies to AC, adds to B. You're going to rewrite this middle term, and you're going to factor by grouping. Problem 35 looks a little weird since it has x to the fourth and x squared, but it's just like if I had a problem like this. You're going to figure out what multiplies to 30, what adds to a negative 1, and then instead of just having parentheses with x plus a number or x minus a number, you're going to have x squareds right here. So x 
squared plus or minus a number, x squared plus or minus a number. These two numbers are whatever multiplies to 30 and adds to negative 1. Problem 36 is a difference of squares. An example would be like where you take the square root of x squared and you take the square root of 4. You have x plus 2 and x minus 2. Problem 37 wants you to add and then subtract the two polynomials. To add these two, you just combine like terms. To subtract them, write the first one and then do minus and write the second one. Make sure to distribute the negative and then combine like terms. Problem 38 says to multiply. You could either FOIL or you could do a 2 by 3 box. Problem 39 says to evaluate, so you're going to take negative 2 and you're going to plug it in for every x that you see. Make sure that you put it in parentheses. So like that. Problem 40, part A, says to write in standard form. Standard form is the terms in decreasing order of the exponents. So first you would go with negative, or sorry, with 3x to the fourth. Then you would go with negative 4x squared, then 2 thirds x, and then your minus 5. Part B says the degree. The degree is the highest exponent. C is the type. The type would look at your exponent and say um, what, what type it is. So uh, a degree of 1 would be linear, a degree of 2 would be quadratic, 3 would be cubic, 4 would be quartic, and 5 would be um, quintic. Part D says leading coefficient. Once you put it in standard form, it should just be the very first coefficient that you have. That's your leading coefficient. 41 says to describe the end behavior. In your notes, you have a table about end behavior. It says that if your degree is even, your graph is either going to be up, up, or down, down. If your degree is odd, your graph is either going to be down, up, or up down and then the way it the leading coefficient tells you how your graph should end so your leading coefficient being negative would be one of these two because it ends going down a leading coefficient of a positive number would be one of these two because it ends going up Problem 42, you need to start by changing forms. Remember, x to the m over n is equal to the nth root of x, all to the m. Once you change forms, see if you can take whatever root of 32 it is, and then take it to the mth power. Same with 43. Problem 47, the only way that you can add or subtract radicals is if the insides are the same, and 72 and 2 are not the same. So you're going to have to simplify the square root of 72. You're going to have to say, what's the biggest perfect square that divides 72? You're going to put it here, and then that times whatever that gives you 72. Then you need to simplify the perfect square. So an example, if I was going to simplify the square root of 12, the biggest perfect square that divides 12 is 4. 4 times 3 is 12, so I'd get 2 square root 3. If I had had a 5 out here to begin with, I would have 5 times 2, so it would be 10 square root 3. Problem 45, we're just dividing what's on the inside and then simplifying the fifth root. Problem 46, start by taking the cube root of negative 8. Then, with our exponents, we're looking to see if these numbers are divisible by 3. If they are divisible by this 3, then just divide them and bring them out. If it's not divisible by 3, you have to break it apart into numbers that are divisible by 3. Part of your answer will be outside of the cube root. Part of your answer will be inside of the cube root. 
47, to rationalize, we're multiplying by our favorite form of 1, which in this case would be 1 plus square root 2. All I did was take the denominator and change the sign. When you multiply the top, you're going to have to distribute the 2. When you multiply the bottom, you can do the box method, FOIL, or the trick to this one is just multiplying the first two and multiplying the last two. Problem 48. The way we solve these is we start by getting our square root alone, which it is, and then we take each side to the second power to cancel out the square root and then solve for x. 49, same idea, but we're going to cube each side to cancel out the cube root and then solve for x. Problem 50, we're going to cube both sides to cancel out the cube root and solve for x. On all three of these, make sure that you check your answers. You might get extraneous solutions. That means you did everything right to solve it, but it's just an answer that, that when plugged back in doesn't work. For problem 51, we have a square root. So in order to graph this, we want to make the inside of our, of our root equal to 0, 1, 4, and 9. Since there's just an x in there, that's all that you're plugging in for x, and then you can graph it. For 52, we have a cube root. We want to make the inside negative 8, negative 1, 0, 1, and 8. On the inside, we currently have x minus 3. So we're saying what makes the inside negative 8? What makes it negative 1? What makes it 0, 1, or 8? What makes it 0 would be 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. What would make it 1 would be 4. 4 minus 3 is 0. Problems 53 and 54 are just like the previous two problems. Make sure, however, that you're double-checking your transformations. This graph should be compressed, and it should have gone up 3 from the parent function. In 54, you should have had a reflection, and you should have gone left 2 from the parent function. Problem 55 and 56 are asking you to find f plus g and then find f minus g and state the domain of each. So to find f plus g, we just take function f and we add on function g. To find f minus g, same idea, but function f minus function g. The domain of each you have to worry about whether there's a fraction or a square root. So you have to think about what x can equal. Remember, you can only take the even root of positive numbers. So your domain would be 0 or bigger. And then last, it wants you to evaluate at 81. So after you find f plus g and f minus g, plug 81 into each of your answers. Same thing with problem 56. Make sure whenever you do f minus g that you put parentheses around g, and you distribute that negative. Fifty-seven and fifty-eight want you to find f times g and f divided by g. Same idea, you're going to multiply these together and then evaluate at nine. Or you're going to put one over the other. Fifty-nine and sixty are using composition. So f of g of x means to take function g and plug it into function f. So for 59, you're going to take function g, and you're going to plug it into function f. You're going to have to use FOIL or box method here because you're going to have this squared. This should have been an x right here. After you find f composed with g, plug in 1 or plug in negative 2 to your final answer. Problem 61 through 63 wants you to find the inverse of the function. The first thing that you do is you switch your x and your y, and then you solve for y. Make sure you always start by adding or subtracting something over and then multiplying or dividing. Be sure not to divide by, by a fraction. You want to multiply by the reciprocal if you have a fraction out front. 
The last problem, problem 64. When finding the inverse of a word problem, don't switch your variables. So don't switch V and R here. Start by getting rid of the four thirds by multiplying by the reciprocal. Then divide by pi. Then take the cube root to get rid of the cubed.